message to myself that should hit record. And I think I'm now recording. So good. Um, thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, I know it's a long time coming, um, but before we get started with anything, I just want to express my um, severe appreciation for all that you've done uh, this year. Um, in a normal mock trial year, live in-person trials, we typically have about 160 middle school teams. Um, this year, I'm, I'm really pleased that we have 86, um, given that we, we might still lose a few <laughs> along the way. But um, I, I knew it was going to be tough. Um, but uh, I know that these kids thrive on challenges, and this is going to be an extra challenge for you and an extra challenge for, um, for the kids. But I didn't want them to have to go a season without mock trial. Um, not that I, I mean, I think mock trial is pretty special, but um, I think that any activity that the kids can involve in and, and, um, and practice their brain skills is worthwhile. So thank you for taking that much time and effort to make this all work. And having said that, it will work. Um, it may seem at times like it's not going to work, um, but, uh, but we'll get through this. And so the, the watchwords um, for this year are flexibility and accommodation. So whatever we have to do to make it work, um, whatever we have to do to, uh, to give the kids this great opportunity, um, we're gonna do that. Um, so thank you for, for being here. Um, before I, uh, I address my list of, I, I've, I've whittled it down to 10 areas that I wanna cover today, um, and then also answer any questions that you have. Um, I also wanted to um, introduce Lauren Barnes, who is um, an intern this year with the Center for Law and Civic Education and has done already some great work with um, the Iowa Mock Trial Program. So Lauren, if you want to say hi and tell people a little bit about yourself and then we'll, we'll move into the meeting. You're muted. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Barnes. I am a Hempstead High School graduate here in Dubuque, Iowa. I'm currently on a gap year before attending George Washington University in DC. I have, have the amazing opportunity to work with Director Wheeler with the mock trial program and I'm ex very excited to continue working throughout the year. Lauren made the mistake of volunteering, and, um, and you know what happens when people volunteer is you don't say no, and you put them to work way beyond, um, way beyond uh, uh, what they had th probably thought they were going to have to do. Um, and, uh, and Lauren is basically responsible so far for all of the online forms and surveys and, and things that we've sent out. And um, as you'll see a little bit later, um, I'm gonna share uh, the roster forms that you'll be receiving soon. Um, and the ballot forms that, uh, that the judges will have to, to um, be able to do this all virtually. And as Lauren mentioned, she's in Dubuque and I'm in Des Moines. We've only met virtually. And so that's appropriate that we're doing a virtual mock trial this way. So thanks again, Lauren, for, for agreeing to, not knowing what you were agreeing to um, back, in the, uh, back in the early summer. So um, I wanted to first of all give you a competition overview um, as I mentioned, there were 86 teams that, um, that registered to participate this year. Um, and based on your um, survey participation back in the summer, and then um, also our logistical problems, logistical information, we've decided um, that each team will participate in two preliminary rounds, once as plaintiff and once as defense. Um, the trials are scheduled between Monday, November 9th, and Monday, November 16th. So there's plenty, there were plenty of times to choose from, uh, plenty of ways to kind of stretch this out so that all the teams could participate in two trial rounds. Um, the, the times and dates specifically in your sides for your two rounds, um, hopefully will come out on Monday, if not Monday, then Tuesday. I've received um, all of the participant forms uh, ex with the exception of a handful. And as soon as I get the last few in, um, I should be able to start scheduling specifics. I will not be sending out the Zoom login information, opponent information, courtroom assignment until closer to the trial. Um, but you can look for the next piece of information um, early next week. Um, 
the first round, the first and second rounds will be um, randomly paired. So rather than having regional competitions, the state of Iowa is a regional competition. Um, it's pretty much based on the, the dates and times that you're available. And then from there, I just pick two teams that, are, that can go at that time and, and pair them. Um, similarly for the second, the second round as well. Um, for uh, roughly half of the teams that, that are participate in the, the two preliminary rounds, will advance to a playoff or a play-in round that next week, um, beginning, I believe, Wednesday the 18th and going through that Saturday, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Um, so uh, some teams, the, the top four or five teams, will get an automatic bid to the state competition, and then the rest will be playing in to fill out a 24-team field for the, the state tournament. So let's, let's just use it as an example. Um, if we, uh, we want to get to 24 teams and we have five teams, for example, that qualify automatically from the first two playoff rounds, we need 19 more teams. So you double that and that's 38 um, plus the original five is 43 of those 86 teams will advance to a playoff round. And I have your preference forms um, for when your playoff would be and uh, I'm hoping that that can be uh, mostly power matched um, with just a couple of, of different accommodations that might need to be made based on um, availability. So that then gives us 24 teams to go to the state tournament. The state tournament will take place the week after Thanksgiving, um, the week of November 30th, uh, with the first round tentatively scheduled on Tuesday, December 1st, the second round tentatively scheduled on Wednesday, December 2nd. Um, so every team in that 24 team um, will still go one round as P and one round as D. We'll do a, an awards program, an announcement on, on Thursday, December 3rd. And then um, from that 24 teams, we will whittle it down to eight quarterfinalists. The quarterfinals will take place on that Friday, December, I think that would be December 4th. If I'm, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but I think that's what it is. Um, and from the quarterfinals, we'll, we'll go to a semifinal, which will either be that Friday or that Saturday morning, and then a championship round, which will be that Saturday afternoon. So that's all subject to, um, you know, technology and, and uh, weather and, and all other stuff willing. Um, that's, that's the plan that we've come up with. Um, and again, flexibility is, is the, the watchword. So if, if something hinky goes on during the preliminary rounds and we need to change things up a little bit, we will try to give everyone as much notice as possible for that. So that's the competition overview. The second issue that I have is the actual trial process. Now I've got like a page and a half of, of bullet points here. I'm just gonna run through it very quickly. Um, Theoretically, it should, it should look a lot like an in-person mock trial um, with just a few nuances and, um, uh, and squiggly bits in order to accommodate the, the, the Zoom format. First of all, everyone should have team codes. We assigned those earlier. Um, you're gonna definitely need those team codes. Um, anyone participating, anyone joining to watch the trial, um, anyone logging into Zoom at all is going to have to have that team code because that will help us sort teams into the appropriate courtrooms. Um, as I mentioned, soon you will have the dates and times for your two preliminary round trials. Um, and then I will send the login information uh, shortly before your trial date. So you're going to have the login information. You log into Zoom. Um, and when you log into Zoom, um, the first thing I want you to do is to change your, um, change your name um, so that it reflects the appropriate naming protocol. And that also will help us sort trials um, very quickly. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna go up to my name here and I'm gonna hit the um, rename function. And I'm just going to make something up. I'm gonna say that I'm in courtroom six and then my code is ABC that I'm the plaintiff and my last name. And then I will go ahead and hit OK. And so what that tells me as, as people log in, the first thing I'm looking at is the courtroom number. And so I will be putting people based on their courtroom number into the appropriate courtroom. 
The second double check is to make sure that, um, that if I put courtroom six and on my handy dandy chart, ABC is not supposed to be in courtroom six, then I can start asking those questions. Um, are you sure you're in courtroom six? Are you sure your code is ABC? Um, the P or D helps me be able to figure out, okay, do we have all of the plaintiff teams? Do we have our team members? Do we have all of the defense team members? Um, and then the last name is just gonna help the judges as they go along to be able to look on their ballot and say, yep, that's, that's the person I thought I, was, um, I thought I was evaluating. Now there's a slightly separate, a slightly different coding um, protocol for um, other people. So, um, if you're a coach, for example, you again want the, the, the courtroom number, you want your team code, you want P or D, but rather than put your name, since we have judges who may know you, um, go ahead and just put coach um, and, and capitalized or not capitalized, it doesn't matter, but that way we, we can put them in there. Um, I saw someone ask if you've got um, people from the same family, so you have similar last names. You can you can put a comma after the last name and start and put the first name as well, or you can put a first initial dot and then and then name. So it could be Wheeler comma John, or it could be J dot Wheeler. However, you need to be able to distinguish that. Um, I will be telling judges that they will put um, the courtroom number. Um, and then just the, the big word judge and then their last name. Um, hopefully we will have trial coordinators in most every courtroom and they will put their courtroom number um, TC or trial coordinator and then, um, and then their last name as well. Um, the question is, will the witnesses use their witness name or their actual name? My preference would be for their actual name um, because that way the, the judges will be able to, um, to see from the roster form um, that the uh, that that's who, they're, that's who they're evaluating. The ballot, when we cover that, um, you'll see that there's a, a identification for both the, the character that the, the student is playing as well as the student's name as well. And then for any observers that wanna join in, um, I would also request that they have a courtroom number, um, the team code and just observer or OBS, um, something like that, so that um, they're not identified in a courtroom um, and then they can mute and, um, and um, turn off their, their video as well, but can, can enjoy and, and watch the trial. So that's the coding protocol. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, there'll be a sorting procedure. Um, when teams enter, um, I'm gonna try to put the, the students into courtrooms first followed by any spectators who are, um, who are joining in, followed by the trial coordinator um, for that particular room, followed by the judges. So theoretically, when the, the judges are, are entering the room, um, hopefully everything is ready to go um, and, and they can get things started as, as quickly as possible. Um, the trial coordinator will handle some of the housekeeping details, just remind people about the naming protocols, remind people about uh, muting and, and uh, turning off the video, um, introduce the judges, and then basically they're my eyes and ears in each courtroom so that if something is going, going horrifically wrong for technology or for mock trial purposes, they can pop out of their courtroom um, and talk to me or Lauren in the waiting rooms um, and, then, um, and then we can help resolve any, any particular issue and put them back into their, their appropriate courtrooms. At the end of the trial, they have a few uh, more housekeeping details, mostly reminding the judges to submit their ballots electronically, to submit their, um, their comments electronically, um, and then um, thanking everyone for participating, and then you will exit um, out, of the, uh, out of the Zoom courtroom. Um, so the presiding judge will then do um, introductions and uh, pretrial um, uh, matters. The judges will already have uh, copies of the case. They will have a separate uh, copy of all of the exhibits. They will have copies of the rules. They will have copies of their ballots and they'll have copies of rosters from the teams. So all of that stuff that you normally take care of during pretrial, um, you don't need, to, don't need to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to run the same conflict checks on the judges that, that I know. So if, if there is a judge 
who walks or zooms into a room and says, whoops, I can't judge that, they will be able to pop out and I will be able to do switches within the trials that are currently going on on that Zoom platform. Um, on some days and sometimes there may be enough trials going on that we'll be using multiple Zoom platforms. Um, I think for the preliminary rounds, we may have as many as two or three. For the state competition, probably just need two. Um, and so I will have other options to move judges um, from one room to the other. Um, so the, the first thing that has to happen during the, um, during the pretrial is if there are any changes to the rosters since you submitted them, because the judges will have what you submit. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you're submitting the rosters, but they'll have, um, they'll have student names, um, and the roles that they're playing. And so if something happens between the time that you submit the roster and the, um, uh, and the, the time that they're judging, that's the time to, to notify them that um, so-and-so is no longer portraying or no longer doing the opening statement. It's now this student. Um, uh, we had to change witnesses. So this, this um, a young person is now doing this witness and, and the other one is now an alternate or, or whatever changes. This is also a good time to introduce teams. So what I would ask is at the very beginning of the trial, all of the students who are taking an active role in the trial, keep their video on. Um, and then uh, so that they, the judges can actually put um, uh, names to faces, which will help with the ballot process. Um, once the pretrial has been completed, the only people who should have their, their um, video on are the judges. Um, the participating attorneys. So for opening statement, it would be the plaintiff's opener and the defense opener and the judges. Um, depending on how you're doing your courtroom setup, if you've got a situation where um, you are not having the timekeeper on their own computer um, in a separate location, um, they can also be visible um, because it's possible through speaker view to put them off to one side and, and not get distracted by, by the timekeeping issues. Um, but all the other, um, all the other participants, all of the other coaches, all of the other um, spectators should be muted and should have their video off throughout the throughout the the proceedings. Um, at the end of each presentation, we're going to ask the timekeepers to report time via the chat function. So you've noticed at the bottom that there's the the Zoom chat, and there's an opportunity in the Zoom chat to chat to everyone. Um, and so uh, um, I would suggest the timers chat to everyone and just publish the time. Hopefully the plaintiff timer and the defense timer are on the same page and that's a good way for the judges to check. Um, if, you are, if you want your timekeeper to do extra duty, for example, using those time cards during an opening, that's why you might have the timekeeper also on camera. Um, they're to be muted, but they can hold up their time card so that the person giving the opening knows how they're, how they're proceeding along. Um, during the case presentation, uh, any exhibits, any demonstratives, any enlargements that might normally be made um, can be also shared during the, sh the, the share screen function. Um, You'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom, it's in, usually in green. Um, and as long as the presiding judge or the, the ho Zoom host has enabled everyone to be able to share, which I certainly hope I will do, um, then, then um, someone can post a demonstrative post and exhibit um, for, for everyone to see. You may also use the, the, um, the share technology to highlight um, or to, to make a different color of particular statements or things that you want to draw attention to. But I would give you a caution um, so that, that not to leave on the share screen for too long. If you leave it on for too long, number one, it's distracting. Number two, you don't get really get to see the student who's doing the presentation um, and, uh, and I don't know what number three is, but um, I would just say, you know, leave it up for, for a short period of time. And as soon as you're done with that exhibit, go ahead and, and, um, and disallow the share screen function or disable the share screen function. And, and then we can go ahead and see the student giving the presentation. Um, as I mentioned, there was a question about who can do the share screening. Um, if that would be the role of a tech advisor, 
Um, I said you could expand your, your team roster this year if you need a student to do the, the technical assistance. And quite frankly, if you need an adult to do it, a coach, a teacher, somebody else, please do. I'd rather have it work than worry about who's doing it. So, um, so hopefully, you know, the, the student attorney, especially if they are, if they are standing up, um, away from their laptop rather than have them have to fiddle with the, the keys on their laptop. If someone else could just share the screen, um, that would be great. Um, if you're uh, on an opposing team, um, please don't share your screen when the other team is trying to share their screen. Um, I think that's just disrespectful. Um, and uh, it may seem like a joke, but it actually throws everybody off. And I can't imagine that the presiding judge or evaluating judges would take that um, very kindly or find it very funny. Um, so please, you know, play by the rules and, um, and hopefully everything, everything works out. Um, as I said, you can designate a technical assistant to rename, to troubleshoot. Um, if there are technical issues, hopefully that person can help to resolve the technical issues or at least alert the trial coordinator or pop out of your Zoom courtroom and talk to Lauren or I about, um, about any issues that are going on technically, and then we can join and, uh, or try to troubleshoot on our end. Um, at the conclusion of the trial, so the trial is going to proceed as normal. Um, and uh, as, a, as it does in a live in-person trial. And at the conclusion of the trial, the judges may have a few oral comments. We are going to seriously ask them to, to, to limit their comments because um, as I found over the last five months, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Um, and maybe there's, a, there's, um, there's other things the students need to do or get ready for their next round or go back to class or whatever. So I'm gonna ask them to, um, to, to limit their oral comments. Um, and Lauren has developed, um, you know, the Iowa ballot is one of the few left that actually has a comment form as well as the score sheets. We've separated the two. So there is a score sheet and there are comment forms. And while we want judges to submit the score sheets as quickly as possible, they can take their time filling out comment forms and then submit that at another time, um, hopefully within the same day or even with the same hour. But the students will get comments or I will get the comments and then I will forward those to you, either print out and mail or send them as a PDF so that you'll get the same things you normally do in a regular mock trial or regular in-person mock trial. Um, It's okay during the oral comments if everyone, uh, all, of the, all of the trial participants, the students and coaches, um, you know, turn on their video so that the judges can see who they just evaluated. Um, but do keep your mic muted unless the judge is actually asking for any questions. The trial coordinator will then come back on, um, give a few general reminders, mostly to the judges about submitting those ballots, um, and then the trial will be completed. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat that I need to kind of catch up on. Hang on just a second. Um, okay, so the, the one of them is, is uh, how does the timing work with technical issues? Um, that's flexible. Um, our rules that we came up with at the national level, you know, if a student loses, um, loses audio or loses video, um, and once the judge is, is um, alerted to this, they're, they're to give, you know, um, no more than five minutes for the, the, the person to be able to, to rectify the problem and re resolve it. Um, I think that's, that's up to the judge's um, discretion. Hopefully they will be, um, they'll be generous in time to allow a student to come back on. Um, basically, the, the, there are three ways to resolve a, a tech issue. Um, number one, the tech issue often resolves itself. Number two, um, the tech issue involves um, logging out of Zoom and then locking, logging back into Zoom. And then the third and final one is um, uh, calling that, that Zoom number and be able to join Zoom via, via telephone, which I had to do at a meeting not too long ago. Um, and I still had my, my original Zoom video up so I could see everyone, they could see me, but I had to actually participate uh, um, uh, audibly via telephone. So those are the, the three basic ways to resolve that. Um, 
and uh, and hopefully judges will allow for some some time for that to that to happen. Uh, my intent is to allow teams to participate. The very last fallback would be to designate an alternate um, to be able to finish either a direct or a cross or a witness testimony or um, an opening or a closing while the the tech is being resolved. Um, So uh, the other one was, was how to share the, the exhibits. Obviously, if it's during an opening or closing and you're using a demonstrative, they can audit the, the, uh, um, the student giving the, the direct or student giving the opening or closing can simply um, ask someone, could you put up the, the demonstrative or let's go to the demonstrative or, or let's go to the enlargement or something like that. Um, for a witness examination, you are still expected to enter exhibits into evidence first before using an enlargement. And then once um, permission is given, you simply ask the trial judge, may I, may I refer to an enlargement via the share screen function? And the trial judge will most likely say, sure. And then that would be the cue to whoever is posting it to hit the share screen and go up. <clears throat> I would gotten a couple questions from you about whether spectators would be available. Um, I will tell you that, um, that I've been part of a number of national programs um, and they limited the number of spectators. Um, I'm not sure that they needed to. Um, and so for at least the initial format, the initial preliminary rounds, we would love to have people come and watch the trial. Um, if it gets to be uh, if it gets to be something that's going to slow down the technology or we, we find that, you know, there's hundreds of spectators and it's really slowing up all of the trials, at that point I might have to step in and say, all right, for the next set of trials, there will be no, no additional spectators. But um, we have, a, we have a, a license from Zoom. So each of the Zoom platforms we use can have up to 500 people. And if we're, if we're running like seven or eight trials each, that would be an awful lot of spectators. But I would encourage if there's a group of parents that want to watch, um, if they can socially get together but safely distanced and have a watch party, that would be perfectly fine. And as long as they're muted and their video is off, they can even have adult beverages while the trial is going on and, and enjoy the trial even more, perhaps. Um, I will not be engaging in, in adult beverages in the waiting room while your trials are going on, though. I, I, that's my promise to you. Um, <clears throat> they do need to follow the, uh, the, the naming protocol, though. So, so when they enter, they do need to put their courtroom number. They do need to put their team that they're associated with, and then simply observer. <clears throat> no last names, um, just observer, and that way they're entered into the correct um, correct courtroom. And if there are any issues that arise during a trial that by some, some spectator, a judge will be able to take judicial notice that it was an observer who's related, who is, is associated with, you know, Team ABC that was causing some issues, and we can follow up with that. But I don't anticipate um, any problems. Um, <clears throat> All right, so we've got that. The next is taping. <clears throat> so right now the goal is to record all the trials and to post to a website or to YouTube after the teams have been eliminated. So if team ABC goes up against team XYZ and neither of those teams make it to the playoff round, we would be able to post the, the video of ABC and XYZ. If we have a trial between ABC and XYZ, and ABC lasts all the way to the championship round, the posting of the trial between ABC and XYZ will not be posted until all the teams have finished, have completed their competition. That's our goal. Um, that's also gonna depend on how difficult it is to, to, um, to archive videos. I was doing a program um, not too long ago and it lasted about two hours. And then at the end, it asked me to archive the video and I hit archive and it took me another 45 minutes. So if every trial takes 45 minutes to archive, number one, I'm not sure my poor laptop has enough memory. And number two, I don't want to, I'm not sure I have enough time to spend another 45 minutes after every trial. So that's the intent is to, is to try to record um, and archive the videos for later posting. Having said that, as any of you who are involved in Zoom or have been involved in Zoom know, it's very easy for anyone involved in the program to hit the record button. And guess what? It can record to your laptop. 
I would, I'm not going to discourage that, but I would highly caution that. Um, that's, a, that's open to some ethics violations. If, if a parent wants to hit record and record the trial and watch it with their, their son or daughter or with the team, that's fine. But I do not want it shared um, publicly. I don't want it shared to any other teams um, until, again, after all the teams have been, all the teams involved in the trial have been eliminated from competition. So I, I can't stop you from hitting that record button. But, um, but I would caution how you use that um, at a later date. So, so that's, that's all I'm going to say on, on that. Um, it is an honor system, and I trust your judgment to, to be able to police that with your, um, any spectators about, about sharing the videos. Okay, I've got a few more questions on chat. Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, Okay, we already covered a couple of those. Okay, the technical issues. Yes, the, the, does that mean, yeah, a lot, it would just be the, the, the student who has the tech issues would have to log off. It, so there, there are, first of all, there's a number of formats, right? So assuming that the tech issue takes place in one of those where um, all of the students are on their own, in their own space with their own laptop, that student would have to log off and then go ahead and, and log back in. Um, a lot of times that resolves um, some audio issues and some video fuzziness issues. Um, so that, that doesn't take very long. Um, and someone in the waiting room would be able to then put them right back into the right trial. If it's the format where you have um, all the team is in a single room and you're using only a single or a couple of cameras and a couple of microphones, then the entire team obviously would have to log out and log, log back on. Um, and that's when we would have to notify the trial coordinator and the judge about that we're having some technical issues. We're going to try this real quick and log off and log back on. Um, and if it's one of those that everyone's in the same room, um, and but but you've got multiple laptops going, it, it's something akin to that. Whatever whatever single laptop is having the problem, log off, log back on, maybe even try to find a different laptop or share a laptop and just change the names um, when it gets to be one student's uh, uh, part and another student's not. Um, and the, again, the technical assistant can can handle that. As a fallback to the fallback to the fallback, there is one more way of resolving technical issues that actually happened to me as I was judging one of my rounds in Utah um, back in May. And that is, uh, there were um, one team in particular was having some, some substantial technical issues. They kept getting, uh, they get, kept getting pushed out of, of Zoom, um, not through their, any of their own device, but they just kept leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back. And finally, um, one of the parents who happens to have their own Zoom account said, can we just move this over to a separate Zoom account? And the trial coordinator or the, the Zoom host basically said, yeah, as long as we can publish that to, every, to all the teams that are involved and to the judges. And so we actually were, were logged out and then logged into a completely different Zoom account hosted by, um, by a, a uh, someone not involved in the mock trial competition, and then everything worked just fine. Um, so that's always the, the fallback. I know quite a few schools will have Zoom accounts. Um, some of them have actually prohibited Zoom use. Um, some private businesses, if you've got, a, if you've got um, uh, an attorney coach or um, someone spectating who's got a Zoom account, that may be a, a fallback position as well to be able to just go to a different, different Zoom account. All I would ask is to let Lauren or I know whoever's the Zoom host, so that we're not um, we're not wondering what happened in in courtroom six. Um, why aren't there any teams or judges there? So do let us know all the way along the way. Um, all right, I've been mentioning judges. This is point number five. So I'm I'm still kind of sort of on um, 
yeah, you can have high school students run the tech. That's, that's fine. You can even have, you know, a coach run the tech, just someone who, who understands that. And that's the only help that they're doing, giving during the, during the time is, um, is helping with the tech, not suggesting um, cross-examination questions or adding a paragraph in a closing argument or, or something like that. Um, we've mentioned a number of times that each team is expected to recruit judges for two trial rounds during the preliminary but it's not just the preliminary rounds. If, if someone's not available to judge in the preliminary rounds, but they're able to judge in the playoff round, or they're able to judge in the state competition, just have them go to our website and sign up. Um, and then obviously let us know that, that they're conflicted with a particular school. Um, the great thing about not having regionals or not having a live state tournament is that um, the judges don't have to travel which means you can recruit them from literally anywhere. As I mentioned, I've judged tournaments in Utah, California, and South Korea, um, never leaving the comfort of my own office or my own home. Um, so if you know of, of attorneys in other states, law students in other states, former mock trialers in other states um, who are just dying to do mock trial, have them volunteer. If you've got um, high school students that you're involved with who would like to, to um, serve as volunteer coordinators or trial coordinators, there's a separate link on our website to recruit those people to basically sit in the trials. Um, they, I can offer silver cord hours if, if your school offers those for graduation um, because they're, they're basically our eyes and ears in every courtroom. So do have those volunteers sign up. The judges will be assigned to trials. They are going to be asked to identify which teams they may be associated with and, and try to avoid those trials. They're going to be provided with video training, both uh, or all three on how to Zoom, how to mock trial judge, and how to mock trial judge within Zoom. So there'll be three videos that they're going to be asked to, uh, to look at. They'll be provided with the case, they'll be provided with the exhibits, they'll be provided with rosters, ballots, nomination forms, comment forms, everything they need will be on a special page on the website so that they can have it there right in front of them as they're, as they're um, doing, going through the Zoom trial on a separate screen or on a separate tab, they should be able to um, toggle between all the things they need. Um, number six is the virtual paperwork. Um, so you've already, you've already been assigned team codes, you already submitted your participation preference forms. Um, soon we will be um, uh, sending out roster forms. Each team is going to be asked to fill out two roster forms, one for your team on as plaintiff and one for your team on defense. Um, it's going to ask you a lot of information that the judges can't see, but have no fear. Um, Lauren has figured out a way that, um, that when you submit your roster form, we get the form twice. One is going to be, it's called a private form, and it comes to us, uh, to Lauren and I, with your, your school, with your code, with your coach information, email, cell phone number, all the things we need to do to be able to contact you. A second version, the public version of the roster form, will take off all of that except for your team code, and that's what will be available to judges to be able to print off or refer to before their trial to be able to start filling out their ballot. And it's that form that you'll be referring to when, um, when if you have any roster changes. So there's a roster form. Um, secondly, as I mentioned, there's a judge and volunteer sign up on the Iowa Bar website. Um, Third, there is a ballot slash nomination form, which looks amazingly like the um, page five of the traditional mock trial ballot. Um, Lauren's done a great job of transferring that ballot into virtual form. Um, and then as I mentioned, there's a separate form that basically comprise pages one and one, two, three, and four of the traditional Iowa ballot, the comment forms. So um, you will get ballots for or the judges will have access to the ballot and nomination forms and also the comment forms as well. Um, so this is a good time. Um, Lauren, quickly screen share um, first the roster form so that everyone can see what it is that I will be emailing you very, very shortly. Um, hopefully tomorrow, as soon as I get the thumbs up from, from Lauren that they're good to, good to be sent out, I'll send you links to the roster forms, um, one for plaintiff and one for defense. I can absolutely do that if you give okay. me just one minute. Okay. 
Well, I'll keep talking because I can talk a lot about other things. Um, the judges will be, I've, I've got, uh, for the judging criteria, I missed a point that I had up here. The judging criteria, the judges will be informed that they are not to assess the level of technological prowess of a particular team. They're not to assess a student's appearance or their physical space that they happen to be in. They're not to, um, they're not to evaluate the choice that the team has made on how to present. They are to, um, they are to use the same rubric that we have used for um, in-person mock trial judging um, and to give um, great leeway to students trying to make this whole virtual thing look or work. So um, if it is a, a student standing in their living room um, and, and if it's like my living room with cats and a kid, you know, there's, there's hockey equipment piled all over this place, the judges are not to say, well, that's a, that, that qualifies as a messy, court, uh, messy council table, and so I'm going to mark you down. No, that's, we want to the content of the presentation, not the look of, of the courtroom setting or their physical space where they are. Um, we'll try to make that as clear as possible to, to the judges. How are we doing on the share screen? Should I skip it? It's currently disabled. <laughs> I, can't do, I can't screen share it. For any of them? Um, if I, can, I, when I click on screen share, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, let me, let me go and see if I can. I thought I had multiple participants. There you go. Try that. Oh, I can do it now. Okay, okay. sorry. That was, that was me. See, the technological issues are rarely Lauren, and they're almost always <laughs> me, which is why I have Lauren around, because she actually understands what she's doing. I just fake it real well. Um, okay. someone, uh, someone asked about the, the, uh, the backgrounds. Um, I would caution against um, any crazy backgrounds. If you're going to use a, an artificial background, keep it to a solid co color like blue or black. And I would just caution about the use of any type of artificial backgrounds. I mean, I understand a reason why, right? If a student is in their, um, if, if a student is in their own space and they don't want to show their bedroom, if that's where they're, they're zooming from, I understand. But I also understand that when you start using those artificial um, backgrounds, it, it severely reduces uh, the bandwidth or it increases the bandwidth needed and tends to slow things down. And so you're going to have some audio issues or some video issues because of that. But um, certainly if a student feels more comfortable not showing their space and wanting to show a plain blue or plain black background, let them do that. Um, but, uh, but if we start having slowing issues, that may be why it's slowing down. Um, so this is the roster form. Just scroll down a little bit. Lauren, if you would. Um, so this is the, this will be the plaintiff one. You just um, you know go ahead and enter your team code, um, who your witnesses are, what order you're planning on calling them. We've also added a box for pronoun choice. That will be um, your understanding of whether it is a uh, whether it's a, a he, a she, a they, or a, a z. Um, however, they they refer to themselves. And then the other team, once you know who you're playing, if you download the roster, you will now know the gender. Um, preference or gender um, uh, designation for the, the, the three witnesses on the other side. Just as it is in a normal live mock trial, we understand that there is pronoun slippage, but um, if you have access ahead of time, you should be able to um, uh, try to keep to, to the, the desired pronoun use. Um, and then it follows all the way down. You notice that um, when Lauren clicked on, for example, um, the, uh, the witness box, see that cross-exam D witness one, um, it actually lists the three witnesses. It's a drop-down box. So um, you won't have to actually physically enter those names. You can just click on one and then to um, say which, which student is, is cross-examining that and then their pronoun choice. Um, and as I said, there's another one that looks uh, amazingly like it that is on the defense side that follows the defense part of the case. So that's the, uh, that's the, the roster forms that you'll be sent fairly soon. Um, if you've got any questions about how to fill it up, fill it out um, and submit it, go ahead and just email me and, uh, and I can walk you through it. Lauren, do you have um, ability to share the, um, the ballot form? I can. Okay. 
I will pull it up right now. Give me one second. As I mentioned, the ballot form will look suspiciously like the page five score sheet that's always been part of our mock trial ballot. Um, it is, has um, been ingeniously designed so that instead of entering numbers, there's also drop down boxes from zero to 10 in half point increments so that judges can still give half points. I encourage half points, but no, but they will not be able to put quarter points, eighth points, 16th points, or figuring it's a uh, Olympic gymnastic competition and, and 8.6253679, um, anything like that. It's just going to be um, whole or half points. The other great thing about the ballot, um, so the judges will fill in the plaintiff code and the defense code. Once they do that once, it will self-populate throughout the ballot. They put they choose what round it is. They put their phone, their name, their phone number, their email in case there's an issue. And then it just follows the trial case. So um, click on plaintiff opening um, and you can see zero to 10 on half point, half point values. Um, we have designed this so that all of the fields are required, so a judge will not be able to submit a ballot if they have skipped a number. Similarly, it's self-populating, it, it adds itself, so sc uh, scroll down to the bottom. Can you scroll down to the, the bottom of the, the Absolutely. Form? Okay. I think it wants me just to hit it and then scroll down. There we go. All right. That was a really bad opening statement. Um, so it follows the same course, and then it goes the closing arguments. We were we're still maintaining that overall team score, but the great thing about it is that um, it it's going to total. So you see that she entered a 1.5 for the opening statement, and that 1.5 is in the plaintiff total. Um, so before the judges uh, enter a team score, they will know whether they are entering a score that will result in a tie or not. So they'll be able to kind of see their, their score and say, yep, I, I can give one team half a point more, and that breaks a potential tie. So um, it will not allow them to submit a score that has any blanks, but it will allow them to check their math, and it will save us some time on our end when we're doing the tabulation. At the bottom of the score sheet, the same as we have on our um, live and in-person ballot, there is an opportunity to nominate students for outstanding attorney and outstanding witness. They simply type the student's name in, check, click whether that was the plaintiff or defense side, um, just as we have on our, um, on our, our in-person ballot. If the judges decide not to nominate someone, they just put their initials in that box on the very bottom. And then in all situations, when they hit submit, their ballot is miraculously um, transported to my email account where um, I know A, the trial is done, that the ballot has been received, and I can start entering scores into the regular score sheet. So that's the ballot. And one more thing, if you can share the, uh, the comment form, um, and then we'll move on to, uh, to a couple of other issues before we, we end for the day. Will do. Okay. Now the comment form also is going to look suspiciously like pages one through four of our ballot. Um, we've tested this and um, uh, judges can write, um, what was it that Donald was using? It was like Lincoln's second inaugural address. So yes. if, if, uh, if a judge wants to write Lincoln's second inaugural address in every single comment, it will accommodate that many characters. So unlike the, the paper ballots that we have that the judges have been able to use, if some of them really like writing notes, they can write tons of notes. Um, but I scroll down a little bit. Um, we have not made this uh, mandatory. So if they have very few comments or no comments for a particular role or particular function, they don't have to comment, some, comment on it. We're going to encourage judges to take time after the trial to complete the comment forms because they do not need to be submitted at the same time as the ballots. But it's going to follow the same, the same um, flow as our um, in-person paper ballots have in the past. Okay, so let me, um, let me skip to item number seven. And that has to do with uh, the technology and uh, presentations. As we've mentioned that there are a variety of options that we presented to you to present your mock trial case. Um, option one, 
um, in no particular order. Option one is that the entire team is able to gather in the same physical space. You find a, uh, a wide screen um, or a wide, wide angle um, camera. You find a, a boom mic or something that's going to be able to pick up the trial. You socially distance, you space, you figure out the blocking um, that you need, and you, you basically present your trial as you would in person, but the other team and the judges aren't there. Um, but they, through the magic of Zoom, they will see it all. Second would be that the, um, the team is, is all together, but they are each using or they're using multiple laptops. Um, there are some issues with potentially with, with reverberation or feedback on the audio. So I would encourage you to practice that and figure out um, what volume levels you might have to have if you're going to use that function. And then the third um, option that we gave you was that basically every single student is on their own in their own space with their own, their own laptop. The very early competitions, the ones I, the one I judged in, in, um, in Utah in May, that was mandated. There was only one team, I think, that, that could get together. The rest of the states had lot, basically lockdowns and wouldn't allow um, more than five people to be in the same room at the same time. Um, I want you to be able to use whichever format, whichever technology you're most comfortable with and is, is being um, observant of whatever public health officials say in your community. So in some communities, they may say you cannot have 10 or 12 students in a room at the same time. Um, and if that's the case, I don't want you to be violating health code um, or health officials. If you're in a place where, um, where students are comfortable being back together and you can do it and that's your preferred way, that's fine too. Um, I just wanna make sure that, that we all have an opportunity to, um, to do our thing and to, uh, to do it as, as best as possible. As I mentioned, the judges will be, have, will be briefed and they are not to take into consideration you know, which teams have elaborate courtroom setups in a, court, in a classroom, as opposed to which, which teams are, are Zooming from their individual um, living rooms, bedrooms, or, um, or office space. Um, I know my son, for example, is, is all virtual so far and is, is using the dining room table. Um, I'm not sure that he'd be that comfortable um, sharing the screen uh, for opposing with all of my, uh, my wife's knickknack collections. Um, they're, they're valuable. It's just, um, she, uh, what are those things called? Um, QB dolls. She's got a collection of QB dolls in a cabinet that would be situated right behind where, where Cam goes to school. And so anybody who would be watching him would most likely be assessing the value of the QP dolls or saying, I didn't even know they made a lawyer QP doll or something like that. Um, so we're not, we're trying to get the judges to, uh, to evaluate what the students say and not their, not their surroundings or the strategy that you make as a team to be able to present. Um, each of the various formats have its own challenges. For example, there's a bandwidth and a connectivity issue with multiple computers. There's an audio and video quality. There's uh, camera and mic adjustability. All of those things could possibly go wrong, and they will. And so that's why flexibility has to be our watchword. We have to just be able to adapt um, and allow students to time to try to figure out how they can make it work. <clears throat> There was a question earlier about um, the preference to sit or stand. I can't remember what our rules say. Um, that is a student preference. We would request that um, students making objections stay seated, um, but you know they they would be on microphone or they would be on microphone. They would be on video, but um, to to make an objection adjust their camera so that they can be seen standing and then readjust it so they can be sitting is time consuming. So for objection purposes, we would ask that the council remain seated. Obviously, witnesses are going to be seated at all times. Whether the presenting attorneys are standing or seated is entirely up to them and to you, whatever is most comfortable and whatever the technology can accommodate. So if they're, they're fine with being able, practicing ahead of time that says, when I stand, I can move my camera back and forth um, and so that, so that I know where to stand. And I suggest you know, using gaffer tape or masking tape or something on a floor so that they, they see, okay, if I stand here and I adjust the camera here, I will be able to be seen. I will caution you that when they stand, they will need to speak up. And I have noticed 
especially middle school students. You know, they may be the loudest student you ever have in your classroom. You put them in a different situation and all of a sudden you can't hear them. And so for the benefit of everyone involved and some hard of hearing judges and me, um, I would prefer that they talk, they speak up. So if they're standing, even though they may be in their own room, they do need to be using their good courtroom voice to be able to project and be heard by everyone. So that would be that. Um, so um, if problems arise, the first thing to do is to advise the presiding judge and the trial coordinator. Um, often the issues on the Zoom resolve themselves. If needed, as I said, you can exit and then, um, and then re-enter. If needed, you can log out and log back in. If needed, you can phone in. If needed, you can provide a substitute. And if really needed, you can find someone else who has a Zoom account and use that for the remainder of the trial. Um, there was a question about, um, about uh, health and safety. Um, I would, I mean, I, this is a preference. Um, there is no mask mandate in Iowa, so I can't impose a mask mandate. Um, what I would say is that it would be my preference for anyone who is not taking an active role, if you're all in one space together, if you are not the, the attorney or the witness who's currently on the stand or who's standing and delivering, I would really like to see masks. I would really like to see you reconfigure your courtroom so that there's instead of four attorneys sitting at a table, there's two attorneys sitting at a table at the opposite ends of the table so that you can provide as much distance as possible. If you can get your hands on some of those, um, some of those, those visors that they're using in real court these days, um, certainly that, that's allowable um, and that would allow us to be able to um, still see the student speaking. Um, for my own, I, I'm hard of hearing and I rely heavily on lip reading and it has been a real challenge during the pandemic to try to understand and hear what people are saying because if they're wearing a mask, I have no verbal or visual cue to be able to pick up on what the conversation is. Um, I try my best, but it, it, it's just, it's a, it's a losing game. So I understand if your county does not mandate it. If your school does not mandate that kind of social distancing, I'm leaving it up to the individual teams to consult with your, um, the appropriate health experts. So your school nurse or your public health department to figure out what's going to work best for you. There was a question um, earlier about uh, referring to, ref conferring with co-counsel. Um, that should happen infrequently, but it does happen. Um, obviously, if you are in the same room um, with, with co-counsel or, or the student that requests to, be, to confer with co-counsel is in the same room, um, ask the judge's permission, obviously, and then um, mute the mic and you can confer with co-counsel. Um, similarly, if you are in different locations, you're going to have to rely on alternate means. So um, you can either private chat in the chat function, which probably wouldn't be the best way to do it, or you can rely on cell phones, text messages, or emails, um, which could cause a whole bunch of other issues. Um, and that is the ninth issue, which is coaching and ethics. The same rules apply, as always apply in the in-person mock trial, where, um, that students are not to have contact with coaches. Now, clearly, if they have technical issues, I want them to have contact with coaches. If they've got a real problem going on, um, either with the tech or, or something non-trial related, I want them to be able to get your help. But if it, is about, if it is something that deals with the trial itself, you are on your honor system, you're on your own to, to um, promise not to, to help in that way. This is a competition for the kids, and I want them to be able to demonstrate what they know and what they're able to do. Um, and so I just ask you um, that if it's non-trial related, please help. If it's, it is trial related, please don't help and, and let the students resolve their issues. Um, and the same goes with the use of notes. You know, we always say that obviously witnesses shouldn't have notes. Listen, there are ways in Zoom for witnesses to have notes, but I'm hoping that they don't use them. Um, similarly, judges may, may mark students down when they're giving uh, presentations with, you know, with notes or without notes. And again, there are ways to configure to be able to use notes. I would hope that the students would not use them if they're comfortable in making a presentation. Um, Similarly, there are a variety of technical, technical and technological games that can be played. 
Um, for example, screen sharing when it's not, you know, your screen to share, um, that, those types of things. Um, and, and again, that's on the honor system. Um, it is part of the ethics of the program and, um, and judges may possibly um, deduct points from teams that are trying to basically get over on their competition through, through those type of means. And then finally, number 10, this is the last thing I have, um, is remember that the competition is about the kids um, and giving them a challenging opportunity. And we should be able to figure this all out together. Um, it is a grand experiment. Um, as I mentioned, there have been law schools, there have been um, colleges that have done mock trial tournaments at a small scale. Um, I've judged high school tournaments in Utah and California and in South Korea. There are other high school tournaments going out there. Um, we will be the very first to try a large scale middle school Zoom competition. A lot of states that offer middle school mock trial are not offering it this year because the Zoom thing is just too much for them to handle or they're pushing it back significantly in the, in the time schedule. I think we can make it work. Um, I, I know and love all of you and have worked with you and I know that, that you can help those students figure this out and that we're gonna have a great positive experience for, for everyone. Um, the world will be watching. Um, my friends that I serve with on the national board at the high school mock trial competition and my colleagues among the other state coordinators are eager to help volunteer because they want to see how this all works and how they might be able to um, improve their own competition when they have to do it this spring. So um, the eyes of the world are upon us. Um, things will go wrong horribly. Hopefully we will have the grace and flexibility to make it all work and give the students a, a, a great um, a great program. Um, I have not checked the chat to see if I've addressed um, the specific questions that you have. So at this point, if anyone wants to ask questions live and in person, go ahead and unmute and, and ask the questions. It's about five after five. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but, um, but if there are five or 10 minutes worth of questions, I think that's, that's not too much to, to ask. So ask away. I just had a question about um, how you determine who will go to playoffs. Is it head to head, whoever gets a better score, or are you taking like the top 24 scores? So the, uh, the teams that are advancing to the playoffs, it'll be the same function that we have used um, in regional competitions. So it, the number one criteria will be winning both plaintiff and defense rounds, on, not on the legal merits, but on performance points. Um, and then ranking those teams based on the total overall points. Um, since we're gonna be taking a large number to the playoffs, um, roughly, what did I say, 43 teams, roughly half, um, there is every likelihood that high scoring one and one teams will get into the playoffs. Um, obviously, if your team um, does not fare well as plaintiff and as defense and are 0 and 2, um, at the end of the two preliminary rounds, they most likely will not be advancing. But uh, it should be a guarantee that if you're 2-0, and you're at least going to the playoffs, and the top scoring one and one teams will also meet them there in the playoff rounds. I had a question regarding um, what happens if there's technical difficulty. You had mentioned that the, the student needs to log off and log back in. And I wondered if instead you meant just turn off Zoom, exit the chat and then, or exit the video and then come back in. So, so there's Or alternatively, two. does every single, oh, does so, every single student need to have a Zoom login? Um, no, so if, if every student, if, if students are joining separately, so if you've got, 10 students on 10 different computers in 10 different locations, they will all be using the same login, um, but only the student who's having the technical issue would have to log out. Um, and that's a two-stage process. So first they could, they could exit their courtroom, their breakout room, back into the lobby where Lauren or I will be, and we'll try to get them, we'll try to push them back in and see if that works. If they come back out and say, well, that didn't work, then we will actually encourage them to, to uh, exit Zoom, to end the Zoom, their Zoom participation, and then go ahead and click on that link again, 
where they hopefully will see Lauren or I in the waiting room and we'll put them back in the trial. So it's a, it's a two-step process. The first would be just exiting their breakout room. And the second, if that doesn't work, is to exit completely from Zoom and then to log back in. If it's an entire team that's together or a team using um, uh, multiple devices but, but fewer devices, um, than, than everyone having their own, then, um, then it's only device that, that's having the issue would have to be, uh, would have to be exited. Um, if the team is all in one place, but they're using their own, their own devices, and one device seems to be having a problem, at that point, it may be most appropriate to have the one device um, uh, shut off and then to share a device between multiple attorneys or multiple witnesses. Um, taking all cleaning precautions uh, as as needed, you know, having the uh, having the the thing of bacterial wipes on your desk like I do, um, so that that you can wipe the stuff off between between people using it. Understood. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, that's John. a great. Uh, um, so, Michelle, thank you for that. If you're using Chromebooks, you're going to have to uh, you, you have to clear stuff out. Um, Chromebooks in general don't like Zoom, um, but if you've got a lot of other stuff on there, you need to turn off any, any apps that are running like in the background um, because it, it, might, uh, it might slow things down. Um, I would encourage you, there's a way to log in without, without putting the, um, the Zoom um, app on, uh, on, your, on your laptop, or, or, um, but you tend to do better if, if you've actually got a, a Zoom loaded and then, then you're going straight in. Um, I would also, unless it's absolutely necessary, I would discourage students from trying to do it on their cell phone. Um, the cell phones don't work too well with the camera and the microphone, it sucks the battery and then all of a sudden you've got, um, you've got other issues going on. John, I have a question about those team roster forms. Mm -hmm. You said that on that form, you put in your, your team name, your school, your coach's name, all that. Yep. Then when I'm competing against another team, and you said I pull their roster so I can see the gender, mm -hmm. does all of my information disappear as a coach? Yes. The only thing that will be on that roster form is the team code and then the list of students and what roles they're playing. The private form that Lauren and I keep um, and archive are the ones that have your contact information. And if you've got a crazy name associated with your, your team, um, I'll be able to see that. And so at, at any type of recognition ceremony, I'll be able to, to congratulate the team by that crazy name. Um, but in terms of your opponent and judges, all they will have is the, um, the code and then the, um, and the student names and what roles they're portraying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm practicing good wait time on Zoom. <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't have to encourage you to, uh, to participate. I know that that's been the bane of most teachers' existence for virtual teaching is that the students come on, they mute their mic, they turn off their video, and uh, you're talking to blank screens and you never even know if there's someone on the other end. So um, fortunately, there are people like me and my kid who can't shut up and they more than fill the time that's, that's needed. So uh, he's getting high marks for class participation during the Zoom. Uh, I think maybe, um, maybe some teachers wish he would be less class participatory, but uh, he comes by it honestly. Are there any other questions, comments? Um, well, then I wanna again thank you for, for joining us tonight. More importantly, thank you for working with the students. I know that this has been a huge chore for you um, to try to make school work and then to try to make everything else work um, and try to make this activity work with your students. Um, I'm blessed that I've been able to um, find you all and find these kids and give them a challenge every year. Um, and uh, and I, I'm just congratulating you for, um, for all that, that you do. I'm going to, to stop the recording soon, and then I will post it probably tomorrow. Um, I'll send out a, a quick email, um, maybe with the, um, the roster forms, if those are ready to go, and then directing people to the, the website that will have this video as well. And um, 
uh, and that way, if there was something I went over too quickly, then um, you can always watch this again and see yourself in living color. Um, otherwise, if there's nothing for the good of the, else for the good of the cause, thank you so much for your participation, and I look forward to seeing you um, at a Zoom competition coming up soon. Um, now I've got to I've got to archive this, and I've got to rush home because the great game show that is the presidential debate is on tonight, and I don't want to miss that. Got to pop the popcorn and 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 crack the beverage and and enjoy. So thank you again for uh, for um, all that you're doing with these students and for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice meeting everyone virtually. Nice Thanks meeting. again, Lauren. You're going to GW, Lauren. I am. <laughs>